why can't a Singaporean work in this position? Why is it always given to someone else from not from here? Not all industries are equal. Hello and welcome to another episode of Red Dot Hot Takes. My name is Hosan Leong and today we are going to tackle another pillar under the Forward SG exercise. But first, here are my guests. First up, we have Ms. Roshni Matani Chong. Hi. Uh, here you are a CEO as well as in charge of theasianparent.com. Not just any Asian parent, but the asianparent.com and also very involved in the startup community. Tell us a bit more on yourself. Thanks for having me here. Um, so firstly, I identify as a mom. So that's my main identity. I am mom, mm -hmm. uh, I'm wife, I'm daughter, and then I'm business owner. Um, so I run The Asian Parent and alongside with The Asian Parent, we have a direct-to-consumer FMCG brand called Mama's Choice. Ah. Um, so we do content, we do community, and then we also build and manufacture products that we sell back to the community. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, thanks for and I'm very involved in the startup community. <laughs> okay, yeah. Very important as well. <laughs> yeah. Helping them out. Helping them to start up. Mm. Okay. Well, and up next, we have uh, Mr. Yip Meng Feng, and he's the head of Seedly. Um, when I first saw that, I thought, oh, that's an agricultural firm, but it's not. Um, he, apparently, you help millennials deal with their finances. Yep. And what about us millennials who have no clue? We'll, we'll get there. You get yeah, there. So, <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, so I'm, I'm from Sydney. So we are actually a personal finance community platform uh, that helps Singaporeans make smarter personal finance decisions on their anything finance. And now we are actually looking into career given the current situation ah. a little bit. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, well, well, we'll chat more about that in just a while. And my third guest is Minister Tan Si Ling, Minister for Manpower. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the invitation. And Maybe how's the, the landscape looking like for us in Singapore so far? A lot of uh, good reasons to, to be of good cheer. Okay. And looking forward with a lot of renewed optimism. Um, we're looking at how to also refresh and also renew our social compact with this forward SG exercise. Mm. And I think generally um, there is consensus in how we should be looking forward in how we should be working together mm. and everybody contributing their part. Now, you know, jobs and employment, of course, people think it's part and parcel of living what? You get a job, you get paid, then you can feed yourself, right? So how is this empowerment? Uh? So there are, there are actually two broad themes that's coming out from uh, a lot of our discussions with, uh, with, with different groups of uh, Singaporeans at different age groups and different sectors. Um, generally, uh, two themes have, have come out consistently. One of them is uh, opportunities for all Singaporeans. So opportunities for, for a good career progression, um, for them to be able to provide um, in terms of opportunities for not just for themselves, but uh, for the people that come after them. Mm -hmm. And the second theme is uh, on assurances to ensure that um, there is a level playing field, um, there's fairness in terms of how our fellow Singaporeans are, are being treated at work, in terms of career progression, in terms of recruitment, and the opportunities that's given to them. So mm -hmm. those are broadly the, the, the themes. And I see. of course, the as a result of that, um, as a consequence of all of the discussions, generally, it is actually a, a, a multi kind of a, a party effort, meaning that the employees, the workers, they have to work to continually upgrade themselves. They have to be cognizant of where they are, vis-a-vis -vis their career sort of prospects mm. and what are the opportunities that's available to them. For the employers, um, it is ensuring that the same level playing field exists for their Singapore workers and all their workers at every stage in terms of their career. Mm. And then for the government, to play a role in ensuring that we continue to remain connected, open to the world, bringing the best in terms of technology, in terms of uh, talent here, mm. to train our people to continue to give them the exposure and also to eventually move them up the career rungs, the, the career ladders, mm -hmm. the career prospects. Okay, so it's a tripartite kind of yeah, approach to yes. this. Um, earlier on, you spoke about we can look forward to perhaps brighter days, you know, being more positive about the future. But 
we read everywhere there's dark clouds, you know, coming, a downturn, this and that. So I want to ask Meng Feng, right, in the, in the fintech sector, what, is, what, are the, what are the feelers on the ground for that? Mm. I would say uh, if you look at the uh, whole world right now, um, there are definitely many economies moving towards uh, what we call recession. Mm -hmm. And I think Singaporeans are definitely feeling the, the impact of that, right? I mean, on the ground, if you look at the news over the past few months, you are, you are seeing news of like layoffs happening in the startup scene, where even bigger companies such as Shopee are actually uh, cutting down on their manpower yeah. uh, in an attempt to save costs. Yeah. yeah, we're reading right in the press, like all these tech companies are just cutting, cutting. I mean, I think Spotify is the latest one as well. Um, Roshni, you've had first-hand experience about this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's been it's been a really tough year, and it's not just uh, you know the last couple of months. I think uh, in in the industry that I'm in, which is you know digital tech, we've been hearing warning signs since about April or May of last year. Mm. That's when it became very clear that you know the economy was just. Um, it wasn't just Singapore, but it was a global thing. Mm. So I think, you know, around the world, we're seeing, right, geopolitical tensions. We're seeing interest rates have, have risen. Mm. Uh, we're seeing inflation. And all of this is really having a ripple effect on businesses, but also on, uh, on the people on the ground. And so, you know, one of the things that we had to do was uh, cut cost. And um, like Ming Feng said that, you know, uh, human capital, right? A human talent is a huge part of a lot of business cost. And, and you know, we, we first tried to optimize other things, but uh, around September of last year, we made the hard call that we had to let go of some of our people. Mm. And this wasn't just in Singapore, but this was across my seven countries. Um, so that was, you know, very difficult because in my 10 years of running the business, I've never had to let go. I've never had to do a layoff. I've never had to do a retrenchment. And so companies, uh, the tech companies, the startup companies, uh, you know, um, you know, the shoppies of the world, um, you know, we've all had to make the hard call that at the end of the day, it's about having sustainable growth. Right. And um, unfortunately, that has trickled down to having to let go of people. Well, and that, of course, would lead to a certain degree of unemployment, right? The people not having to work, uh, can't work. So that leads us to our very first hot take of the episode. We should keep wages low so that we will not have as much unemployment. So if wages are low, that means your companies can employ more people, and which means unemployment will be low, right? So what do you think, um, Minister? As a result of the opening up, and as a result of generally some of the measures that we have undertaken, tourism sector, the aviation sector has, has opened up um, quite a fair bit. So as a result of that, you find that even in the hospitality, um, some of the, um, not just the outward facing industries, but the inward facing ones are still seeing growth. And um, if, if anything at all, there is um, some shortage of the type of uh, expertise, skill sets and talents that's needed. Mm. So to your point about um, the whether um, wages should be kept low so that the employment rates are, are kept high. I don't necessarily subscribe to that kind of uh, thinking, partly because of the fact that um, most of our Singaporean core, they are actually very well trained and there are a um, significant number of courses to allow them to continue to upgrade themselves. So we have uh, for those mid-career um, workers, there is the SG United um, um, upgrading, reskilling type of uh, courses that's available for them. And at the same time, um, we do offer quite a fair bit of grants using my other hat in MTI, MTI itself yeah. for jobs redesign. The whole idea is to continue to get the companies to think about how to transform, how to pivot, how to remain creative and innovative. Mm. Because, you know, ostensibly, you know, given the, the, the size of our market and the size of our country, we, we need to continue to stay ahead of the curve. I think the critical part of it is to think about how do we level up in terms of our productivity. That is where then, um, you know, in terms of some of us as consumers should even think about uh, paying that bit more, um, not that much, but that bit more in terms of making sure that our fellow Singaporeans, in terms of their, their ability to, to, to have this um, uplifting of their wages, can enjoy some of that upside as well. Mm. Ming Feng, what about your thoughts on this hot take? True. So I think what uh, the COVID-19 pandemic have actually uh, enabled the world to do is to be able to adapt 
and to work remotely. And when this happens, it also means that there's no border now when it comes to uh, workplace. Uh, you may potentially tap on, um, say, cheaper labor in a sense. But for Singaporeans now, what we will be facing is actually a more competitive, more competition with more peers around the world. You are no longer just um, um, maybe competing with people uh, in the same on the same island in the same country. Yeah. You are potentially competing with another engineer elsewhere. Okay, so you know on that note, Roshni, because you know at the end of the day, if your company, for example, letting off people is all about cost. What would you do in that sense? Would you the wages? Yeah, so it's so such a great great question, yeah. right? And I think this is uh, something that would keep me up at night because it's it's a mixture of two different things. The first one is, you know, as a Singaporean, I love my country. But at the same time, as a business owner, you care about two things, which mm -hmm. is the first one, value creation. And mm -hmm. the second one is shareholder value creation, <laughs> yes. right? So, so at the end of the day, you're constantly going through this battle. Um, and the fact of the matter is that we can't keep wages low in Singapore because it's an expensive country. It <laughs> it's not possible to have uh, low wages mm. and, and have a, uh, you know, an okay lifestyle in Singapore, yeah. uh, you know, as much as we may uh, argue otherwise. I think at the end of the day, mm. um, you know, but is the answer keeping wages low? No, mm. I think the answer here is it's multifold, right? But one of them is just to make sure that as Singaporeans, we understand that it's important for us to upskill ourselves and mm. keep ourselves competitive, uh, especially with the rise of the rest of the Southeast Asian nations as Absolutely, well. Yeah. Uh, prior to moving back to Singapore, I was living in Jakarta ah. and it was amazing to see the development that I was in Jakarta and the lifestyle that I had in Jakarta as well and the quality of people I was working with in Jakarta as well. Mm. I was working with people who spoke excellent English, could yeah. write excellent English, yeah. uh, who were creative, who were great at mathematics. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we have uh, this perception that, oh, the rest of the world, you know, we our education system is, is excellent and we're producing excellent talent, but so are the other countries as yeah, well. We mustn't and forget that. We mustn't forget yeah. that because we're not talking about 10% of India. We're just talking about working with the top 1%, the top 1% of Indonesia. Absolutely. Uh, with a population of 270 million, million people. Yeah. You know, yeah. you just you just need the top 1%. And we can't be complacent. We can't yeah. be complacent. So Absolutely. I think that's that to me has been the hard lesson that I've learned mm. over these last few years. Mm. Absolutely. I think uh, if I may jump in, I guess the, the point is that it behooves us for us to really price differentiate and also differentiate our service offerings, right? You cannot expect to do the same bread and butter stuff over and over and over again and, and, and say that, um, you know, that you, you could continue to charge higher for the same level of service. And hence, we talk about productivity, right? Value added. Um, there's the other element in terms of how do you want to ensure that the, the final finished product, right? The, the, the sort of the, the, the capping of it all, where you crown this, this um, service offering uh, has that added sophistication, the, that finesse and the elegance. And that is something that today, um, the Singapore brand stands for. I mean, I came from healthcare. I used to share this this uh, uh, story with a lot of people, right? You can get, um, you know, any sort of uh, um, operation anywhere, right? But why is it that people would not want to go to to, to somewhere where it's the cheapest, mm. right? Because it is the entire ecosystem that, that comes with it. So we're talking about wage now, right? Let's go back to that. What if we have minimum wage? So... Everyone gets, you know, you know you start at that level. So at least, yeah, you know, what, what do you think about that, Ming Feng? Minimum wage. I think that's a topic that's been like heavily debated uh, for a while now. Um, I'm actually in the middle. I'm, I, I've seen successful models on both ends. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I can ask this question to Mr. <laughs> Tan. <because laughs> personally, yeah. personally, yeah. I feel minimum wage uh, to a certain extent does benefit the population. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that uh, the things that you are spending on will not adjust the price accordingly mm. to the minimum wage that you are spending. Right. Next, be, given that uh, manpower is our only resource that we're exporting, having minimum wage can again harm us mm. uh, that way because we now no longer be able to stay competitive with uh, our peers should they have to pay a certain amount for, for the same job as mentioned just now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So is there something the government is working on with that? Or 
You know, Hosanna, I think that's a that's a great point, you know, that you brought up. I I don't necessarily subscribe to the model that um, the minimum wage uh, works well for every country. In mm. fact, um, I think in many countries um, that I used to operate out of when I was in corporate life with the minimum wage, the unemployment um, so far has been higher mm. compared to those. And, and at the fringe, um, actually what happens is that many employers actually just hire them on a part-time basis or some of them are not even registered. I think the beauty about our system um, is that we have the progressive wage model. Oh, okay. So the progressive wage yeah. model, um, exactly like, like what it says, is, is, is progressive because it recognizes the fact that not all industries are equal. Fair enough. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, someone in hospitality, mm. right? Someone in uh, food, F&B, food services, someone in retail. How can you have one universal minimum wage for all of them? Mm. The level of, of uh, um, work that is required, the level of manual input, the level of uh, automation, they're all different. The level of, of uh, exposure to the elements, to even the type of work that you do would be different. So as a result of that, we are very, very mindful and very sensitive and responsive to the needs of each one of the sectors. So rather than have a blanket uh, uh, sort of level across everyone, we engage. We took the laborious route of mm. engaging each one of the sector to find out what is the, the, the level that mm. both the industry can bear. We actually even devise a transitional scheme. So we have a progressive wage credit scheme three and a half billion dollars over the next few years to help companies to tide over this period so that we can take the pain off them when we move all of these people into the progressive wage model. I see, so um, it's not across the board so at the moment, it's no. sector well, by it, sector. Yeah. So the plan oh, is ultimately okay. by uh, within a year or two, nine, more than 90% will be covered by this progressive wage model. Uh, if not, there'll be a progressive wage mark, right, in which we cover, I think, 90, 93, 94%. So with that, our plan is to uplift all of the, the B20 low-wage workers upwards and provide them with opportunities at every single stage in their lives. Okay. Well, Roshni, three and a half billion there, government. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, what we're, what we're talking about here is uh, the B20. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I do think that we, we do... You know, a mark of a society is really about how the, you know, equitability mm. um, and the equality you're seeing amongst your citizens. So I'm glad to see that we're, we're focusing on that. Well, it's time for our next hot take, which is productivity will lag as long as we have access to cheap labor. Um, you know, one example, I think, Ming Feng, is like, for example, we have a fantastic accounting software nowadays that we can use online. Um, but then we still have accountants who are essentially just pushing paper around. Uh. So what, what's that all about? <laughs> yeah, so I think with uh, the advancement in technology is definitely uh, possible that whatever mundane task that you might be doing right now will be ultimately replaced with uh, automation or even mm. through technology. Give you a good example, right now there's a, this hot topic on chat GPT, yes. uh, where you can actually ask the uh, AI a few questions and it generate a very well researched um, content for you. Mm. So in a case that improves your productivity of some sort, but I wouldn't, if if you as a as a worker, I wouldn't say you will look at it and feel threatened. Uh, what I think that you can actually, uh, the approach you can actually take is that look at it and understand where are the areas that you can actually improve on and to really like um, infuse this technology into your workflow and make you a better worker. Give you a good example, right? We all know that ChatGPT is toneless, um, not the best for writing articles, but it gives you the facts. As a writer, how can I use that to improve the way I uh, write my content and yet add in my creativity and uh, my kind of localization into the article? I think that's the skill that uh, some of this technology will still will probably not be able to take away from you. 
So I I'm respectfully be- disagree with you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think uh, AI is getting smarter and smarter, and it's just a matter of training uh, AI up. Uh, and I do think that, it, especially in this case for Point ChatGPT, they would definitely be able to replace writers and copywriters and um, yeah, really, you know yeah. uh, content creators. No work for us uh, anymore. <laughs> you know uh, because at the end of the day, it's about giving them the right prompts and teaching right. them. Uh, I have created some of the funniest jokes and limericks from AI. Um, I have uh, created some of the most loveliest, beautiful love letters to my husband from AI. <laughs> Their writing style has managed to adapt my, to my tone of voice as well. So I do think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's not just about having access to a human uh, affordable labor, but it's also access to technology and is technology going to replace a lot of our jobs? Yeah, because I, I remember hosting uh, 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 a huge HR conference pre-pandemic. And um, and one hot topic was AI is actually, you know, taking over HR work as well. Um, and can they take over the rest of our jobs, you know? Um, How is that going to affect the broad strokes Singapore if everyone goes into AI and you know our jobs and everything how that's going to happen i think that's going to be a, a very very long long stretch um i i can perfectly resonate and and uh, with uh, both roshni's and, and also mingfen's um, uh, ideas uh, concerns as well as um, expectations um i i tend to look at it um as ai as an enabler because we could actually think about the, the infinite number of permutations that are available. And the more uh, the AI can replace certain basic functions, the more the human mind will then go on to devise mm. newer AI algorithms to come up with, with ways and means. And one of the things that I find it very difficult to put into an algorithm is intuition. Mm. Mm. Intuition where you, 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 your hunch kind of thing itself. I don't think that uh, today um, you, you could actually program or, or put an algorithm for you to develop that. Mm. Um, and, and for that matter, therefore, look at that little tick or, or that little uh, uh, wins or that, 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 uh, that spark in your eyes when, when you know, someone hits on something. I, I think those part, um, you know, your, your, your algorithm would probably not be able to replace. Having said that, um, I, uh, I'm a perpetual optimist. I think that um, we are on a threshold of a huge uh, uptick. Uh, if anything at all, um, if this AI um, um, transformation and, and this revolution can happen, then we will see an acceleration. There are tremendous um, upstream and downstream positive implications. Um, the development of, of nanobots, for instance, mm. um, how it, it would actually um, go into your, your blood vessels, you know, to, to uh, think about, you know, replacement of certain valves. Today, it's really happening, right? Mm. Um, to, to even clearing <laughs> clogged uh, arteries and so on. So, so mm. more than replacement, I think it would, it would enhance human potential many, many times over. We are going to move on to our next hot take then, because I think it, this is also quite a hot topic that the only way to succeed in Singapore is to become a <laughs> foreign talent. Um, I think over the years, a lot of discussion <coughs> has happened about, oh, how come you know, you're giving this PMET job to a foreigner? Um, why can't a Singaporean work in this position? Why is it always given to someone else from not from here? Um, what are your thoughts on that, Roshni? Such a loaded topic. It is quite loaded, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I don't think that the only way to succeed is to become a foreign talent. <laughs> uh, <I'm glad>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I do understand the why companies hire foreign talents over Singaporeans. Uh, in some industries and in some vocations. Mm -hmm. um, I think the heart of the matter is that for a lot of Singaporeans, um, we've grown up in an ecosystem that may not reflect reality outside of Singapore. 
Mm. Not every country is as law abiding. Not every country is going to have people who are as meticulous or as transparent. Um, you know, so you know the fact of the matter is that in Singapore, we've all gone through a certain type of upbringing that is very similar to each other. There might be some differences here and there, but generally speaking, broad strokes, quite similar. And this may not be the reflection of reality outside of Singapore. In a, and in understanding an international what mindset, is an that, international yeah. mindset, but also the mindset of uh-huh. what is it like to work in emerging markets. Right. Uh, because if you look at it, right, Singapore is, um, you know, a very developed economy uh, amongst. Asia, where you know you have a lot more emerging markets, but when I look around and you know and and I interview a lot of uh, you know fresh graduates or young Singaporeans, and I talk to them about the mm. countries around us, and I get horrified with mm. how little we know about Thailand, except mm. for Bangkok mm. or maybe Pattaya and Phuket, mm. <laughs> you know. But you know we don't know much about the region around us. We also don't have a lot of friends. Uh, local friends who mm. are, you know, Filipinos, Indonesians, Vietnamese, mm. uh, Thais, etc. So how can you work well as effectively with a culture if you don't understand the culture intrinsically? Why is this insularity? You think? I mean, if you think we're so well educated. Our education system teaches us so many things, but. Why are we still so insular in that mindset, that thinking, the way of life? In fact, because the same thing, you know, you you go JB, ah, wow, so dangerous, <laughs> ah, wow. It's like you go to any big city, darling. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like what's wrong with you? <laughs> you just gotta have your yeah. So I think we live in this bubble, but. The insularity is very, it, it concerns me because it is that the next generation, the, the next working generation can't compete on the global stage if they think like that. Minister, what are your thoughts? I, I, I agree with uh, Roshni's point, um, exactly. The, you don't have to be a foreigner to be a talent. To your point, the only way to succeed, I think the way to success entails many, many different routes, not just one particular route. And the more you see the world, the more of the markets that you see and you understand what people do, the better you are at managing them eventually. And that is what we're trying to do. But having said that, again, that optimistic part of me will tell you that that's changing. Our youths today, they they are very different, right? They they are a lot more connected, partly because of uh, social media um, and their friends all over. And for them, the adventurism um, the adventuristic spirit, I think it's there. And we are, uh, I think it, it augurs well for us, for us to harness them. And hence, we have all these, uh, we have a global rotation uh, talent program, which MOM has started. We are also pushing ahead with the Singapore uh, Enterprise Program, the Global Enterprise Program, where we actually work with companies, support mm. them to send the executives, the top uh, uh, potential mm. uh, leadership uh, talent bench overseas to get the exposure. Mm. We work with uh, Singapore Business Federation to come up with an action uh, alliance for action plan to see how we can move our top talent all overseas to get that exposure so that when they come back, they can hit up Singapore companies, mm. right? We also have, um, you know, IPOS, uh, which is MES. Mm. They send these people on, 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 on international sort of uh, postings see convents so that when they come back, they, they, they can run our banks, uh, you know, right. and we've got all these fellowship programs. So we have gone onto this thing. We are moving them, them out. Of course, for a short period of time, when they are out there, parents will miss them, <laughs> you know, but when they come back, mm. I think that's where they bring, uh, and mm. coupled with whatever, you know, sort of complementary programs we have put up there for manpower, mm. you know, the highly differentiated uh, 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 e-pass program, our campus framework. On top of that, the, the new one, part, I mean, overseas network expertise pass, where we bring rainmakers here to try and, 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 and create rainmakers. I think that's that's all going to be part of our ecosystem. Okay. Well, in, in the in the sector of fintech, though, because you know, I know the government is bringing a lot of IT people in fintech, or um, PM Lee was talking about it last year. Um, working with, I mean, we're bringing in all these foreign talent, so to speak. What are your thoughts on that, Ming Feng? Because we can't find them here, can we? Yeah, so maybe if I can link back to 
uh, this take also on whether um, to be successful, you need to be a foreign talent. I think uh, first and foremost, there is no need to have that boundary again um, that you must uh, between Singapore and the rest of the world. Right. But as uh, we move into a uh, level where it's highly competitive with uh, globalization and every other country's picking up pace uh, to compete with us, I think we need to really uh, be brave enough, take that risk and also look outwards instead of constantly looking inwards for sure. Um, now having said that, yes, we do bring in quite a number of talents um, in various space. And even for, uh, I, I think for how I see this is actually expands our view to a lot of other things. Quick example for uh, Sidley, um, it was actually a project that uh, won a hackathon in the States and it's not here. Oh. Yeah, so the co-founder went through some program that NUS have arranged uh, and sent them overseas to study and learn from some uh, of the folks out there and they brought back this idea. So that being said, you can also look at Carousel and some of these startups having the same type of path where they really learn elsewhere and they come back to Singapore to really set up their stronghold simply because it's somewhere that they are familiar with. Um, the ecosystem allows them to thrive uh, to build a strong foundation before they venture outwards uh, from here. It, it might be uh, a, a choice thing, but I think uh, at least it's familiarity that they feel comfortable starting out here. Mm -hmm. So what I feel we can do then is to really optimize for learning. I think uh, when it comes to hard skills, right, there's always ever changing needs. Um, maybe uh, your, your skills will be uh, irrelevant maybe tomorrow, but I think what keeps you uh, going should be your soft skills to learn how to adapt and to learn from, to be humble enough to learn from the folks all around the world, mm. and then to then innovate and bring the idea across and execute on it. So Roshni, Ming Feng was talking about some soft skills and uh, that is needed, but what are your thoughts about the soft skills that Singaporeans are lacking? So I think that Singaporeans have a lot going for us, um, you know, and, you know, we have grown up in a multicultural environment, and I think that's wonderful, which means that we can resonate with people uh, who may not be from the same culture as us. I think what Singaporeans uh, might lack is that sometimes we are uh, very rules abiding, uh, sometimes checklist driven, but we fail to recognize that maybe not everybody has been given the same rule book as us. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, as a Singaporean core population, that's one thing that we need to uh, to just be much more cognizant mm. about that our reality is not necessarily the reality of someone else. True. And yeah. that's something that we need to build in ourselves. This year, the new year of 2023, year of the rabbit, etc., etc. Down the road, the Ministry of Manpower and perhaps even MTI, um, what, what can we look forward to? Moving forward um, for the year, the pace of disruptions, the pace of change will accelerate. And, um, and within the short to medium term, we will continue to need a lot of foreigners, global companies and so on to continue to network with us, to have exchange of ideas and very, very engaging, productive uh, uh, tech transfers because that's how we keep ourselves ahead of the competition. But the reassurance that I want to give to all fellow Singaporeans is that gain the exposure, gain the experience and gain the wisdom and the intuition because mm. that's what's going to keep us ahead ostensibly for the next 30, 50, hopefully 100 years. And for us to continue to be self-sustaining, for us to be, continue to be relevant on the world stage. And having said that, we will be rolling out a whole series of measures to make sure that the workplace will be a fair level playing field for our Singaporeans and for everyone. Mm. At the same time, um, we will continue to invest significantly to develop our Singaporeans, to give them every opportunity so long as they want to, mm. to upgrade themselves. We also want to give this reassurance to all Singaporeans that as long as you continue to walk, we will walk every single step with you. 
thank you for the very optimistic um, and enlightening uh, uh, those comments. Uh, thank you, my guest, Minister Tan Ming Feng, as well as Roshni. Thanks for being with us on this episode of Red Dot Hot Takes. Now, if you've got any comments or questions, you can always click on the description below. And we hope to see you in the next episode. In the meantime, work safe, work well. <laughs>